continuous field data, um, but this time we're going to have a slant on how field data are used in NASA calibration and validation activities. I will describe those in a second. Um, the big picture here is you're collecting data, you're going to put it into an archive, it serves a purpose for NASA. So uh, what we thought we'd do through this lecture is give you some sense of why NASA invests in this class, why NASA is invested in the success of this class, and um, how the data that you collect for whatever project you use are in some way going to be supporting uh, making the Ocean Color Satellite products better in uh, the end. So a couple of uh, preamble comments here. You're going to hear the term CalVal all the time through the course of your career. It's just shorthand for calibration and validation. It's not a real great term. It has been kind of repurposed over and over and over again through the course of time. It is a catch-all phrase in this community now for any activity related to the on-orbit calibration of a satellite instrument, plus all of the field programs associated with that plus the validation of all of the different data products, plus the development of all of the different algorithms. So it really encompasses a broad spectrum of, of uh, activities that support the satellite mission. So as I mentioned before, the purpose of this presentation is to give you an overview in how we use these data. Um, I will probably spend more time than anything else describing the issues we have with this. So that as you move forward and you start thinking about how to plan your cruises, plan your sampling, um, you might remember some of this so you can circumvent some of these issues and make all of our jobs a little bit easier. So the outline is briefly going to be talking about the use of field data, the challenges of accumulating a lot of field data, different ways of acquiring field data, and then quality control metrics. So quality control and quality assurance. First, an overview of the flow of field data in a NASA Ocean Color program. You write a proposal to Paula, she funds it, she gives you money, you get your ship time, you go out and buy your instruments and collect data. You've sold your soul to NASA at this point. Now, within a year of the moment you collect these data, they get submitted to CBAS, which is the permanent archive for all of the data collected under the auspices of this program. You have a year to do that. These data, paid for by taxpayer money, are now available to the public at large. We use them and other groups use them to validate our satellite data products, to develop algorithms, to evaluate these al algorithms. And in some cases, these data are actually used to physically calibrate the satellite. With a nod to quality control and quality assurance, it happens in a couple of different places. The expectation is that you take what you've learned in this class and try to do exactly what Emmanuel was telling you five minutes ago. Go through the process of convincing yourself so that you can convince others that your data are sound. And then our staff and data managers do take a look at it. More eyes are better. We do look for certain things. But that said, we're not on the boat with you. We're not the one watching your autonomous vehicles go out there. You are the first line of defense to get great data into the system. And after a couple of years, when you're all very successful and your proposals are getting refunded and everything is amazing and awesome and life is sweet, we can assemble a database that looks something like this. So this is a little bit old. Uh, probably two or three years old, but this represents all space and all time for data collected, uh, data that resides now in the CBAS archive. And so at first blush, you know, it looks pretty filled, especially when you focus on the U.S. East Coast, but then you see these huge patches of ocean where suddenly there aren't any data. And you might start asking yourself, that's fantastic. I know the satellite collects data here, but how do I know it's any good? All right. Chapter one, we're going to talk about three different uses of satellite data and why we expect great things from all of you. We'll start with vicarious calibration. Ken probably spoke briefly about this in the context of MOBI and how it's used. So I will not belabor too many points, but we're gonna step through the process itself uh, a little bit. There are really three flavors of on-orbit calibration. So at this point, 
not only has your instrument left the laboratory where you can no longer touch it, do anything with it, modify anything with it, you cannot calibrate it any further, gets integrated to the space vehicle, and then you have this enormous rocket, which is 75 to 80% explosive fuel with a little tiny satellite instrument on the top, and you send it on a rocky ass ride into orbit. Okay, but you can't touch it anymore. But space is a harsh environment, so you know things are happening to it. But you can do your best to take what you learned in the laboratory and apply those calibrations to the instrument. But now there's no atmosphere to protect you and it's getting beaten by solar ray, solar, um, solar radiation, all of the other things that make space a harsh place. It's gonna drift with time. There has not been an instrument developed that hasn't drifted, either in, for field work, for satellite work, anything. It is the name of the game, it's gonna drift. So we do do a temporal calibration and we use the sun and the moon as references for that. There is a third one, and this is the one we're gonna focus on today. It's called vicarious calibration. Um, what it really is is one last absolute calibration of the instrument, and in this case, we reference an Earth's surface as ground truth. In this case, this is a bad Moby-like cartoon. We calculate a final single gain adjustment, and what that means is it's a single correction factor for every wavelength on the satellite. Step through that process. But note, in this process, you have the atmosphere correction. And so the final absolute adjustment does correct for the instrument, but it also cor uh, corrects in some ways for the algorithm system itself. So it is a combined calibration of the instrument and the atmosphere correction algorithm. And when I'm saying gain, really all I'm talking about is the ratio of my ground truth target and what my satellite actually sees. And these gains are calculated at the top of the atmosphere. So the way that proceeds is we have MOBI. MOBI makes a measurement at the same time the satellite makes a measurement. We perform the atmosphere correction process to identify all of the atmospheric parameters and to calculate all of the atmospheric parameters at the time of the observation. And then we use those almost to reverse engineer the atmosphere correction process where we take the in situ target and use that information and propagate yeah, up to the top of the atmosphere. So in this case, our ground truth now has the layer of atmosphere on top of it, and we have a top of atmosphere radiance for MOBI. Okay, and then the final gain is a ratio of those two. And if you calculate, if you get to do this enough, then you can see the stability of the averages that come out. So the plot up here is gain factor versus time. So every dot on this is one of those matchups where we have a view of the Earth at the same time as the view of the satellite. And the gain is the ratio of the, again, the in situ target propagated to the top of the atmosphere to the top of the atmosphere radiance that is actually seen by the satellite. So pause for a second. Is that clear to everybody? Okay. If you've done this correctly, in terms of calibrating the temporal drift of your satellite, you should see that there is no drift in these gains. There's no slope, there's not, they're getting higher with time or they're getting lower with time. But that said, you cannot use this as a method to robustly get rid of a t t temporal drift. You can see some scatter around here. And the scatter, again, is on the order of one or two percent. But remember, one or two percent at the top of the atmosphere is a big, big number at the bottom of the atmosphere. And so this cloud of data, in practice, first principles, exceeds any kind of drift you would actually see. So it's not a reliable source to do the, this is why we need to separate this calibration from this calibration. This has to be applied first. Sure, I'll, I'll actually get to that. Okay. Yep. But it's a good question. Um, and so you figured out the legend then, accepted as solid and rejected as not. It, mostly it's a homogeneity test, yeah, but a couple of other things, looking at flags and masks. So, but we'll put a pin in that for a sec, we'll come back. Gain versus solar zenith angle, gain versus satellite zenith angle. These are sanity checks, again, to convince ourselves that everything 
up to this point has been accounted for and there are no biases based on time of day or viewing geometry and so forth. But field data, this is all done with field data. You could use another satellite to do this. You could use models, as we'll talk about a little bit later, but we need field data. And as Ken talked to you about, MOBI is a huge, substantial effort with a huge team. It's not an easy project. And so however vicarious calibration proceeds in the future, you need the absolute best quality data in the field as you can possibly get. Because any biases, any imprecision in your data is going to get propagated directly into the calibration of the satellite. That's going to be a problem. So, um, so in this case, you can see that we've accumulated a number of matchups for calibration over time. And this, this is for CWIFs, and you're looking at on the order of uh, nine or eight or nine years. So you might ask yourself, when is enough enough? The goal, of course, is to accumulate statistically enough information so that your gain is robust, so that you trust it. This plot here shows gains for three different wavelengths as a function of the number that goes into the average. So number one here is the first matchup that we had. Number two is the first plus the second combined and then average. 20 means there are 20 that go into the game. 40 mean there are 40 going into that average and so forth. And the standard error of the mean is what the error bars are around here. As you can see, over time, these gains do stabilize. But the red line I put in was just to show you where my eye tells me the stabilization begins. And if you propagate it down, the red line that I drew is around 40. But let's say it's somewhere in the 30, 40, 40 range. So to get a stable gain, you need roughly 30 to 40 samples. but at a place like Mobi right now, you're only getting about 20 matchups a year. So what does this tell you? It tells you to get a good, final, stable, vicarious gain, you need two years' worth of data at this position. Some of this is because of the sensor itself. For example, MODIS looks straight down, and so it sees a lot of sun glint. That makes it a lot harder to do this. But the point is, is if you're doing this at one site, it takes time. This is the marine optical buoy we got discovered. So this, this is how we do it now. This is the gold standard. We've explored a couple of different options for doing this calibration. For example, there are satellites that flew before MOBI was put in the water. Radiometers weren't particularly mature at the time, so there weren't a lot of data. There certainly weren't this number of data available. And so um, this was a thought exercise a few of us did a couple of years ago about what about using um, a model-based system. So we don't have a lot of radiometry for the CZCS error, for example, 78 to 86, but we do have a lot of chlorophyll. And you know, NOAA and others have big databases of chlorophyll. So what do I know about bio-optical models? I know that there are some where if I put in a chlorophyll value, I can take a guess at RRS. And so in this case, that is exactly what we did. We took the chlorophyll time series for two sites where we had a lot of data. This is for uh, the Bermuda Atlantic time series. And if you look at a bunch of different years worth of data over time, you can see a pattern emerges. And this is just the day of year versus chlorophyll for a bunch of different years. This is what that pattern looks like with time. If you take the average of these chlorophyll data, um, and you plug it into your clear water model, then you can create a radiance time series. And these radiance time series were used to calibrate the sensor. Instead, basically replacing the MOBI measurements for this thought exercise. And what pops out the other end is that the percent differences between the MOBI gain and this model gain are on the order of a half of a percent to one percent. But I want to point out that even though they differ by less than 1%. They are signed, and they're in different magnitudes for each wavelength. So while these numbers are small, and we think we can do this, they're going to change the spectral signature of your satellite measurement, just relative to MOBI. And we're not saying one is better or worse, but we're saying there's differences. So if you start mixing your calibration sources, you need to be aware that differences emerge. 
in log space, the chlorophyll derived from Moby versus the chlorophyll derived from uh, the model, and this is for the satellite measurement after the calibration has been applied, look pretty good in the sense that they follow a line, but there is a bias there. And this is just to drive home again. This bias emerges because of the spectral differences imposed by the different gains. Not better or worse, but requires some thought if you're mixing your calibration sources. So God forbid Moby uh, got run over by a fishing boat and sunk. You know, you might look for other sources. That won't happen. <laughs> Sorry, heart attack back there. <laughs> <laughs> or goes on a walk. <laughs> yeah. um, another thought exercise was, was just using alternate field data. So this is where uh, young up-and-comers like yourself might come up with an amazing technology that you decide is the perfect vicarious calibration source. In this case, this is Aeronet. This is a slide I wish I had for yesterday. But as of a couple of years ago, you can see that Aeronet is a very well distributed system globally. This is a little deceiving in terms of what's useful for ocean color in the sense that a lot of these targets are on land, but some of them actually do have coastal sites and they look down at the water. So they're not, so backing up a little bit, a number of the aeronet stations, which is that aerosol robotic ne uh, network we talked about on Tuesday, are outfitted so that they don't do, just do atmospheric measurements, but they do water measurements as well. And they operate very similarly to the hypersass that you had on the boat when you were out on the cruise this day. So that's there. There are buoy networks. I mean, Colin's involved in a lot of these. There are gliders, drifters, other autonomous platforms. I'm sure Mary Jane has talked about those. And then you can do different kinds of flow through and towed underway sampling. And I'm sure Emmanuel has talked about that. So if you, we, the thought exercise uh, that I was involved in was to take a subset of data out of CBAS. Now, this is a hodgepodge of different kinds of radiometers in there, and see if we could derive vicarious gains for those. Um, what you're looking at here is the spectral, uh, the, the spectral distribution of these gains. So the solid line is MOBI. Um, the other lines represent NOMAD. Data from Boussol, which is another buoy like MOBI in the Mediterranean, uh, operated um, out of Villefranche. And again, the gains calculated using these alternative situ data don't differ much from MOBI, and this is, but they do impart differences on your derived products. So this is the same plot you saw for the model-based one where you have chlorophyll from the satellite using MOBI-derived gains versus chlorophyll from the satellite using the alternate data gains. And in this case, you know, the bias is kind of gone, but the slope of the line is different. So for the multi in summary, for the multiple ground truth targets, you can derive gains that differ only from 0.3 to 1%, but again, there are spectral differences in this. And especially as we start entering the world of derivative analyses and inversion algorithms, where these become the norm instead of the band ratio algorithms, these spectral differences are important. So go through these exercises that Emmanuel discussed and convince yourself that you're doing absolutely the best you can, and uh, you know, keep this in mind as uh, as you're doing so. Any questions on vicarious calibration? The focus is on one type of measurement, but there's nothing to say that you can't have the most beautiful IOPs in the world throw them in the hydrolite and do exactly the same thing that we did. Huh. For the CBAS project, is it only NASA-funded projects that are allowed to upload data? To the no, anybody can. Is there any form of like quality control to the data that goes up into the network? It's a mixed bag. I mean, again, it gets back to that original plot where we try to do it, but we're limited in the sense that we're not experts at every kind of measurement technique. So a lot of data that might be really, really useful if it's outside the realm of what we're good at doing, you know, that creates a burden on the contributor to make sure those data are as good as possible. Um, but it's volunteerism at this point, you know. Uh, we do require that a certain format be adhered to and a certain amount of documentation comes to it. So it's a good thing for the contributor saying, hey, I have data into a NASA archive, but, you know, there, there will probably be a little extra interaction. So, but if you have data, let her rip, man. That'd be awesome.
And we, we will find a way to use it. All right, now that we have a perfectly calibrated satellite instrument, let's talk about satellite data product validation. And this is gonna get back to your question, Ben. Um, it's a little bit hard to read, but this is the flow of the matchup process. And it's not much different for how we would do a, um, a validation exercise than a calibration exercise, except for that the calibration ones are a little bit more rigorous. So, um, so building on that, you have your C in, in situ data, um, you find the, clo you identify a satellite that matches in time with your in situ target. You find the closest pixel, extract a box around it. You know, these matchups usually do not just require one pixel. Um, we want to have a box around it. Then you turn, then you find all the flag pixels and all the data that you don't like. And this is part of that process of rejecting something. If too many bad pixels are in there, we toss it. So uh, the obvious are land, cloud, stray light, and glint. Atmosphere correction failure. We don't try to be too too um, prescriptive on this. You know, looking at cockles and turbid water. Just just the flags that are really really problematic. Verify the time differences, and then the rest of this flow is largely statistical. It is okay if we take all the bad pixels out. And let's say we have a five by five box. So we have 25 pixels there, and if we take 20 of those out. Are those five remaining ones really enough to, to do anything meaningful with that we trust? For us, it's not. And here's why. We are burdened with doing this operationally. You know, there, so if there are 1,500 radiance matchups, there's an, unfortunately not someone looking at every satellite, all 1,500 satellite files, and saying, hey, this one visually looks bad. So some of these are programmed in simply to to weed out the obviously bad data and to be a little bit harsh in a sense so that we eliminate as many outliers as we can. Um, where was I going with that? So we look at number of valid pixels. We do a heterogeneity test with using a coefficient of variation. So if there is a big standard deviation of all the pixels in there, we throw it out. We're also a global mission are a global agency, so this may not be the exact recipe you would want if you were doing a validation exercise in the Marascotta River estuary. You may choose to change these kinds of criteria, but, but we have them in place. We do some averaging, filtering, so forth, look for zenith angles, and then if all of these exclusion criteria suggest that these data are great, they're kept. So I went through that fast, but this is here for your reference and you know, the details of the numbers probably aren't the best use of your time right now. But once you've gone through that, now you have your final first cut at a validation process, pro uh, a valid validation results. So in this case, the chlorophyll for CWIFs, chlorophyll on the x-axis, CWIFs on the y-axis. There are some statistics up here. We have about 2,000 matchups which is why we can be a little bit loose and free with what we throw away. Because in this case, we're data rich. I'm not saying that's a good thing, I'm just saying it's a necessary process of doing this automatically. Uh, histograms, all of the statistics you may or may not care about, um, including ratios and absolute percent differences and so forth. But there you have it. Now, if you were really, really trying to convince yourself that your satellite data product was as good as it could be, would you stop here? What is this not telling you? Trends over time, sure. So, uh, trends in space as well. This is just everything. And if you look back to that map, this largely means along the US coast we're doing a really, really good job. It does not tell us anything about how we're doing in the Southern Ocean. And so there are other complementary validation exercises that one might choose to go through. Uh, the first is time series analysis. And this is the same kind of example that I showed f for the uh, near infrared black pixel assumption um, correction analyses in the atmospheric correction talk. It's Chesapeake Bay again. 
histograms of different regions and of all data available in Chesapeake Bay and for different regions. These are the monthly time series. I believe you've seen these before in a couple of different ways, but um, yeah, this tells us something else, something different than the scatter plots. And what I'm trying to build up to is the same thing we were talking about here. You're going to get a bunch of different information a bunch of different ways, but without doing it a bunch of different ways, you're not really constructing the, the full story. If you only have one of these, you only have one answer. If you only do this one way, you only have one answer. So start thinking about how you might look at the data differently rather than just scatter plots. So we do time series analyses. Um, you can also do a long track analysis, and this might be something that you could do with the data you collected on your project. So this is for an Arabian Sea study. This is a composite map of our study area with 13 different stations. Now one thing we haven't got into yet is that when you come back to this kind of exclusion criteria and the fact that the Earth is a cloudy place, just because you visited 100 stations doesn't mean you're going to get 100 matchups. The rule of thumb is roughly one out of every 10. So you go to 100 stations, you might be lucky enough to get 10 matchups. So 10 matchups doesn't tell a great story. And this is the problem that we encountered here. We only had 13 stations, which means in practice, we only really got 12, uh, sorry, two or three matchups. So really tough to tell this story with two or three matchups. Impossible to tell this story with two or three matchups. And so we conceived of this, which is to take the satellite imagery that we did have available. We only had four good scenes. Put them together. Over two weeks, we had four good scenes. Composite them together, like you learned in CDAS, make a level three file. And then draw a line through each of these pixels. And so every black dot you see here is the satellite data for that line drew through all of these pixels. These dashed lines indicate the stations that we visited, and the red data are the chlorophyll that we actually collected. And no, it's not a full time series analysis. No, it's not a perfect match in space and time. No, it doesn't offer a good scatter plot still. But at first blush, this gives us some confidence that the data we collected and the satellite data we collected jive with one another. But there are a lot of limitations with all of these approaches. As you're learning, quality of in situ data, ridiculously variable. Now, take what you've learned. You all go to your separate labs. You all make exactly the same measurements. I can promise you when they go back into the system, they're going to be different. It's just the name of the game. You can follow the protocols the best you can. You can do everything you want, but everybody is different. Every instrument is different. And imagine now a scenario where I haven't met any of you, but I'm just seeing your data come in. You know, it's hard. It's hard to sort out some of these differences. Do the best you can, follow the protocols. Coverage is limited geographically and temporarily. You're not doing this for free, so funding is to dry up. Maybe now we're not getting as much data as we need. Here's one thing we really haven't talked about. You're looking at a little patch of ocean. I'm looking at a five by five, one kilometer square box of ocean. Are those scales the same? Do those scales vary temporally and geophysically? This isn't to say that any of you can't do this. It's not hard at all. But again, you, without some knowledge of what you're doing in the field and some knowledge of a tool like CDAS, it's not easy. It's not plug and play. And again, you're only getting static biases in the final products. So here are a couple of other challenges that you're going to encounter as you set up your sampling program. So at this point, you know how to collect the data really, really well. You've got the money to do it. You've got the ship time. You've figured out a way to collect 3,000 stations on one cruise so that you can get 300 matchups. A couple of other problems are going to emerge. Um, and they all deal with the resolution of the measurements you're going to take. So let's go back to my Arabian Sea example here. This is a bloom of Noctiluca that we had interest in. So focus on this, for example. Mm. 
We've already talked about how data is, even satellite data in certain regions can be sparse. So we had 13 stations there. We only had four good satellite images. What you might have gleaned from the CDAS lab is that you will have a temptation to start binning these data, merging everything together. In fact, I showed you an example for this study where I actually did that. And we talked about how level three binning changes your data itself. Well, here is an example of how it does it. This is the original level two image of the bloom we liked. If I make a two kilometer bin map of that, it looks a little bit better. But if I go to four kilometers, it's starting to disappear. And I go to nine kilometers, it's almost disappeared entirely in terms of it being smeared out. And the number that I would get if I put my cursor over this versus the number that I get if I put my cursor over that very wildly. All right. So the scales over which you're making these measurements horizontally are important. Temporally, too. So again, to fill in some of the gaps, you might be tempted to temporally bin your data. Well, here is the one day where this bloom occurred. If I make a two kilometer map, because I've convinced that I can do that, and retain the integrity of what I'm looking for, but I want uh, to fill in data somewhere else, some other part of the scene where I don't have it, and I do a three day average, all of a sudden it's starting to go away because these blooms are ephemeral. They appear very quickly, they disappear very quickly, plus or minus two weeks, and this is a month. And so now start, you might start thinking about the question you're trying to answer scientifically. And you know, do I need level two data, or do, is a monthly map good enough to do what I want to do? Well, this feature no longer exists in the monthly map. And so if you're doing a validation exercise, you're testing out your new algorithm, you're starting to think about how to build a new algorithm, you need to pay attention as well to the time scale of the data you're actually looking for. You may not want to use this. You may, for ease, or because you're putting it into a hydrodynamic model, want to use monthly data. Well, suddenly, the features you're looking for are diluted. And so just be aware of that. And now in the third dimension, you have vertical resolution. And Ken, did you talk about at all about this kind of stuff? Uh, Colin? So I mentioned when we talked about where you would collect samples. Yep. But I'm leaving it up to you. Okay. Great. Yes. Um, we talked about waiting, but we should talk about it again. All right. So what the satellite sees is kind of an integrated value of the slug of water to which light penetrates all the way down, bounces and comes back up. And this seminal paper from 1975 suggested that 90% of what the satellite sees comes from the first optical depth. So that depth at which KD times Z is equal to negative one. So this is just a fake hydrolyte input chlorophyll plot that I generated with a subsurface chlorophyll maxima and indication of where this layer is. All right, so what the satellite sees is some integrated value of this slug. This part of the bloom really isn't seen by the satellite. So how might you sample this so that you can reproduce in the field the same integrated value seen by the satellite? Well, if you only have the resources to take a couple of samples, where should you place them? These are the kinds of things you're going to need to start thinking about. If I only have a surface sample, it's going to be 0.5 milligrams per cubic meter. If I take a second sample right here, Let's say that one is two. If I take the average of these two without weighting, the answer is going to be 1.25 milligrams per cubic meter. What the satellite is actually seeing, though, if you do the integration, is a value of 0.95 milligrams per cubic meter. So none of these solutions get you back to this number. And what that means is that the vertical resolution at which you sample is important 
because if you do not somehow capture the continuous profile, or if you don't have complementary measurements like diffuse attenuation where you can take, or fluorometry or something else, if you can only take water samples here and here, it's very, very difficult to accumulate all the information you need to actually get to what the satellite is seeing. And if we're comparing this number in our matchups to this number, you're off. Do you want to add anything, Colin? I'm kind of stuck. Indeed. Quick aside, something I should have mentioned earlier. I know this um, is a little bit different than the kind of lectures you've had before, but there are, the role of this class in understanding this material is probably more significant than you think. The 2011 version of this class, their project was to work collaboratively to come up with a best practices document, meaning the best method of putting everything in the water, taking it in the lab, all the way through post-processing. It was huge. It, it ended up being really, really, really big um, final product that, you know, because everybody was working on different chapters. But part of that was almost a summary of all the information that you needed to collect so that somebody who wasn't there with you would 
not only understand how you made your measurements, but also um, you know, all of the other information you might need. Anyway, long story short, NASA used this document to change the way CBAS allowed incoming data to come in. So there are now documentation requirements on how data comes into CBAS, and that's because of that activity out of this class. So we almost we just almost adopted th that that process, um, you know, as as it came out of the box here. So. Um, you know, this isn't intended to, to be up on a pedestal. I mean, what you're doing is actually really having an impact and changing someone else who you've never met's ability to download data and actually trust it and do their work. So keep it up. It's, it's good. This is, um, what you're doing is important. The 2011 one's not done? Yeah. Oh, no, no, not the protocols. This, this is more of the... Um, yeah, best pro. I'm sure I have a copy somewhere. I, 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 yeah. I probably have it here. Okay, um, only one slide on the use of bio uh, data you collect for algorithm development. I think that is probably pretty straightforward and obvious. Um, and a reminder from Tuesday, data you collect in algorithm and for algorithm development activities are not just for the in-water algorithms. They are used in various steps of the atmosphere correction. All right. Getting a lot of field data is not easy. You know this now. Um, and that is true in two different contexts. First, just the distributions in space and time, but also making sure that you're getting complete suites of measurements. So let's go back to the CBAS map here. This is all data collected at all time. If I start stratifying that into years, you're starting to look at something like this. So 2006, 7, 8, and 9. All right. In those years, we have no information in this database about this entire half of the world. And this is not to undermine how hard it was just to get this number of stations. This is a lot of money, a lot of time, and a lot of work by a lot of people. But still, there are enormous gaps. And so this gets into our ability to interpret those scatter plots. What do they actually mean? I'm going to use this as a reference for the next couple of slides. Um, in particular, I want to point out the, a, a place where we pause in this process. Um, th this, in this flowchart, is indicating the place where all we've done from here to here is identify that there is a satellite file available for the in-situ target. And so if you look at all of the data available in CBAS for this exercise, and you just go to that step where I haven't done any quality control, I'm just certain that there is an in-situ measurement in the satellite data that were collected around the same time. This map degrades to that. So this is just the possible CWIFS matchups that we have here. Now, if you were to go all the way through the exclusion process, the rest of the way through that flow chart, this reduces to that. And so again, you're getting to this ratio of just because you were on station doesn't necessarily mean it translates into a matchup. There are a lot of holes in the ocean, yeah. Well, yep. And so that gets to the first point of abundance of field data is hard to come by spatially and temporally. And uh, some of this is getting solved by the autonomous systems. How about complete data sets? This is the map of everywhere. We have remote sensing reflectances. That degrades to that if you look for only those stations where you have remote sensing reflectances and a coincident chlorophyll matchup. If you want to have remote sensing reflectance, chlorophyll, and some measure of absorption, it reduces to that. And God forbid you want backscatter too. If you want all four of these on one station, now you're reduced to this. And again, this is a snapshot in time of about three years ago, so we're a little bit better now. But there is a point here in that if we are trying to validate and develop our inversion models where you need all of this information, you're doing it 
whether you like it or not, on a very regionally and temporally biased basis. This is the standard chlorophyll algorithm slug of data. This is the actual chlorophyll algorithm. So you have your band ratio on this axis, you have chlorophyll on this axis. You're biased by ocean basin. So the gray points are all available data for each of these panels. The blue points are indicating which basin these are in. And so if you go back to our big sea bass map, you may not be surprised that we're representing the Atlantic pretty well. But you start to see some biases emerge in the Pacific. Indian Ocean, for sure, is uh, only representing part of the scale. And I can't tell you how many different papers I've seen that have just explored this, where the, chlor the standard chlorophyll algorithm just does not represent the Southern Ocean. And this gets into that whole one size may not fit all. So you need to understand that why one of the, there are two reasons why that in your neck of the woods the standard algorithms might not work. The first is that they may just be optically different. You know, what, what is in the water in your neck of the, uh, neck of the world does not represent this global mean. But part of it also gets into sampling, too, that there may just not have been a lot of data there. Look at the difference in the volume of data here versus the volume of data here. Which ocean basin is driving the form of this algorithm? Uh, uh, the question, yeah. Why do you think that that's true in the A lot of it is just getting into the first thing, which is the bio-optics are just different there than they are globally. So it's, um, this is largely just a case one kind of assumption where any variation in your spectral shape is driven by chlorophyll. And that is not necessarily true here. And so I, I, my feeling is that these differences are real, that just this global average rep that represents these basins does not represent here because the bio-optics are simply different in this region of the world. This is all field data. So. This is all from field data. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it could. Um, so, the RRS, is, I mean, the chlorophylls are optically weighted. So. And the RRS is taken from the surface. And the RRS is taken. Most, most of the Southern Ocean data is from profiles. So. But a Nader profile. But a Nader profile. So, you're looking at a sm much smaller. Uh, what you're, I think, kind of saying is you're looking at a much smaller slug of water, too. Vertically. I'm worried. It's just yeah. We're always looking at those, those yeah. Mm -hmm. So. No. Yeah. Season. Yeah, and they're probably. Uh, yep. Definitely not the, uh, in the dead of winter in the southern ocean. The dead of winter, regionally in the southern ocean, is probably not a fun place to sample. Okay. Uh, we'll wrap up the rest of this pretty quickly. Um, we already touched on emerging technologies. In fact, you're already dealing with this. Um, so it's almost an antiquated slide. You know, when, when we first started putting this kind of talk together, there weren't a substantial glider efforts and underway sampling efforts. Um, so keep, uh, keep coming up with new ideas and exploiting those. Um, here are a couple of examples of validation exercises we've conducted using autonomous data. Um, these are matchups from the Aeronet network, those subset of, sta of those Aeronet stations that actually look at the water. And um, they are really, really valuable. This plot was created within the first year of the VIRS launch. So think way, way back to that um, Moby plot that I showed you about how many samples it took to accumulate over time for the vicarious gains. Um, it's hard to collect a lot of data right at all, all, all at once. Um, but in the society we live in now, as soon as that satellite goes up, people want to know if it's working and they want it validated. And with one station or a bunch of field campaigns, you just can't do it. And your managers don't want to hear, hey, we don't have enough data yet. We'll get to this. We'll do it as much as we can. 
And so this provided a really nice solution in the sense that it was a number of different stations over the world collecting data simultaneously. And we got a really great look at fears within a year. Uh, that couldn't have been done five years ago. This is an example from uh, Emmanuel's Tara expedition where we um, went through an academic exercise of converting ACS data from an inline system into chlorophyll and then using it to validate modus aqua. And this gray cloud of data are the modus aqua chlorophyll matchups from any source. And the black data are the ones that were from the ACS. And remember, the ACS doesn't measure chlorophyll. And so we used uh, one of Collins' methods to look at the fluorescence line height, relate that to um, a chlorophyll measurement made in the field, convert all of the ACS into chlorophyll using that proxy. And this looks pretty good. Uh, if you get all the way through this paper, we, we took it all the way to backscatter using a bunch of different models, and it didn't suck either. It was really surprising. It was one of the most fun things I've ever written because it was just so... It was one of those opportunities where you're writing it going, this will never work, it'll never pass review, and then the story just kind of got fun. <laughs> and lo and behold, you know, it, uh, it became something interesting. All right, last... And I don't really need to spend too much time on this because you are all experts now at quality control and quality assurance. Um, state the obvious first, one person, one group cannot collect enough data to do this job well. We had a fleet of people funded and you still saw how Spartan those maps are. So groups like NASA rely on you to go out in the field and do this. I've mentioned the word protocols. I mentioned that whole protocol exercise the 2011 class went through to help all of us out. Protocols are actually are, are ridiculously, essen ridiculously essential. Everybody is different, but if you're doing everything all the same and you're following the best practices, of course that can reduce the uncertainties in what ends up in public databases. So the problems with QA and QC is that, uh, the problem is that it's a never ending process. There are always new instruments out on the street. There are always new ideas. So a snapshot in time is insufficient. And uh, one of the things Colin just alluded to but may not have made sense to you is this ongoing activity now of revising the protocols. I mean, we, um, we, had a group of people funded under NASA in the first part of the 2000s. And they spent a lot of time writing down best practices for all of the measurements that an ocean color Calval program might want. And then they weren't touched again for 10 years. And finally, a lot of us had this realization of, that's terrible. You know, there are so many advances and so many papers and, um, that have demonstrated how to do this better. But unless you know where to look for them, it's not easy to accumulate that information. So protocol documents are starting to come out again from the community at large. And um, they're very, it, it is a almost volunteerism to get people to work on them, but it is such an important exercise. So get involved in that too. Think about where you want to be in 10 years and well, we'll just uh, um, kind of wrap it up with this. Make sure that as you're coming up with your methods and you're coming up with your new ideas and you're processing, that you can accommodate reprocessing so that you don't have to go through the painstaking process of repeating everything over and over and over and over again by hand. Document them, make sure they're consensus with other groups that you work with, and you have to revisit them constantly. So. That may not make sense just in words, but understand that the game is changing now. There used to be two instruments to measure radiance. Now there are a dozen of them. They all get to remote sensing reflectance. But do they all give you the same remote sensing reflectance value? That's really important for us to understand. Different platforms, different strategies, and we have a much bigger problem set than we did 10 years ago, too. Now it's not all about the open ocean. Everybody's getting pressure to study shallow, inland, optically complex waters. Can these instruments do that? Our spectral domain is stretching. Do we have a backscattering instrument that goes into the UV yet? Do we have a hyperspectral backscattering instrument? Because the next satellite that flies is going to give you hyperspectral BB out of the box. How are we going to validate that? <laughs> 
And then, anyway, with that, uh, let's wrap it up. There's some bonus material in the presentation about sensor to sensor. Uh, read it at your leisure and ask questions if you have them. Any questions on this material? So that suggests then the, the gain is not, the calibration of the instrument is, n um, the calibration, uh, what that's really suggesting is the atmospheric correction doesn't work in your area. So you're, you're saying that if you're in a field RRS doesn't match the satellite RRS, what do you do? Oh, well, first go back to your field RRS. Um, second, start thinking about how atmospheric correction might not work in your area. It's probably not the gains. It is probably that in the atmospheric correction process, you picked the wrong aerosol. So, you know, that uh, the autonomous, I'm sorry, the, the automatic selection of aerosols and the atmospheric correction process, you know, didn't pick one. You might have an absorbing aerosol, for example, in your neck of the woods, but there are no absorbing aerosols in those 80 tables that I told you about. So. I mean, you can go and rederive the gain, but at that point, you're just forcing it. What you would be doing is forcing the satellite to match your field data. You could do that, but I wouldn't start with that, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> 